Don't tell me you came here to pitch me a story. The show is about nothing. If I'm doing a fake movie, it's going to be a fake hit. Don't blame me. I, I'm not an executive, it's just a writer. It's funny, I'm blocked up. I just feel like I need some kind of indication of what's expected. You're confused. You need guidance? Talk to another writer. And I'm just looking just for, you know, just an opinion. Opinion is I hate it. I mean, you haven't even read it. If it's bad, I'll hate it because I hate bad writing. If it's good, I'll be envious and hate it all the more. You don't want the opinion of another writer. You know, the one film of mine where I had total control came. The studio hated it, but they didn't get to touch a frame. Ed. Visions are worth fighting for. Why spend your life making someone else's dreams? Welcome to FilmClub.fm, your go-to green room where we chat about the craft of cinema, we connect with movie lovers and makers, and we get creative about filmmaking and storytelling. I'm your humble host, Frank Ponce. I'm Colin Levy, your not-so-humble co-host. And I'm Sean Thomas, and I vacillate between being humble and not. <laughs> I've noticed that. <laughs> yeah. Depends on the day, you know. Yeah. Right now, right now, the feeling super humble because technology is not helping me. Totally. Right now. Yes. <laughs> You've been humbled. <laughs> I was just joking. We all are How humbled. many filmmakers does it take to, to run a podcast? Technology has a has a knack of humbling humbling you, you know? We gotta blame the engineers for this one. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Whoever's writing this, come on. <laughs> Let's get it together. <laughs> That's why well, AI is never going to take over. Uh, listen, yeah. It's all, it's all <laughs> exactly. human error in, in putting in, into the uh, the code. So I look forward to the point at which it takes less time to set up for the podcast than to record the podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That'll be a nice threshold. <laughs> we should do it back to back. Actually, we should just record the entire time, uh, like a bus troubleshooting. The setup, yeah. yeah it might be, be more entertaining. Have you guys ever seen Hearts of Darkness, which is the documentary about like the making of Apocalypse Now? It's yes. Uh, oh yeah. We My need goodness. to do a Hearts of Darkness about just like the the behind the scenes of just getting this podcast to air. <laughs> <laughs> we get 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 like a a documentary crew to film each of our perspectives as well and kind of follow <laughs> us around. You know, like <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, it's it's so funny. Um, I mean, we're only three in, so we're good. We, we can have all these troubleshooting issues <laughs> early on. It's fine. Yeah. I think overall the, the vector is positive. Yeah. And, and luckily good. only f- like five people are listening to this podcast, three of which are, are hosting the podcast and two That's of right. which are our mothers. So yeah, we're good. Say. Like, you know, we're not disappointing anyone. Well, yeah. we've crossed over a little over 200 plays altogether. So, I mean, are you guys wow. watching our or moms- listening? Uh, I've listened to it a lot of times. <laughs> they're they're looping it twenty four seven. Got to got to pump those numbers up. Those are wow. rookie numbers. <laughs> That's not bad. Um, <laughs> well, this pod uh, in particular, or well, this particular um, episode, uh, wanna, I want to I want to discuss a, a couple things, uh, mainly in the worlds of YouTube. Um, I should also probably record this on my roadcaster duo, by the way. Oh, yeah, let me start my fine <laughs> backup audio also. It's going to be the best audio. podcast that no one can ever listen to. It'll be great. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, here we go. All right. So my roadcaster duo is now picking this up. So I'm going to clap right here. <laughs> Just so we're synced. <laughs> okay. Um <laughs> we're not too far in thankfully we're only a couple minutes uh so in this pod we'll be discussing the worlds of youtube and traditional filmmaking so i'd like to really dive into what you know what blurs the lines between digital and cinematic storytelling i mean between the three of us we've all i like to think we've mastered the art of maybe captivating audiences you know both in youtube um and filmmaking as a whole but uh, I looked to, is a strong word, but well, gain some competency, some competency somewhere in the <laughs> millions. Maybe I'd say, I think we've collectively maybe done billions with a B collectively. I think I, I, I actually, I, I think that's, yeah, no, I actually think that, you know, it's like 900 million views between Frank and I. Yeah. And, and then <laughs> I like, I'm just like a thin layer of, <laughs> 
<laughs> icing on the top of that cake. Yeah. But there's yeah, a degree for, of mastery to that, right? What would you guys say? I would say I would say it's uh 10% luck and and 90% I'm just a badass, you know. That's, you know. So <laughs> I'm vacillating between humble and not yeah, right now in, 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 in this right. actual episode. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, no, I yeah, think I, I think we've really... been fortunate. I think we've been fortunate enough to, um, Frank. I don't know how you feel to be able to collaborate with some really talented people and bring in a perspective that they didn't have previously. Because we come from a traditional sort of film background, and coming into the YouTube world, we were able to sort of bring some of those principles to some really talented uh, creators and really kind of take them up a level. And that's sort of where I think that we've really helped. Um, kind of boost their their viewership. Correct. Yeah, I think we could. I mean, we've been doing this well over a decade. Um, I mean, my YouTube experience first time I really kind of cracked into it was 2012. I think 2013. Yeah, I'd love to share. You know, our insights about how we navigated. You know, the complexities of not just YouTube but content creation as a whole, even uh, towards today. Like even like I got I got I'm constantly like looking into. Uh, you know, not only writing the trends and the algorithms of, of Instagram, TikTok, whatever I'm, but I'm, I'm trying to, it's a fine line of, of trying to find the right balance of great storytelling, right. As a whole. So, um, that's where I'm at. Uh, so whether you're, you know, if you're a listener, you're, if you're an aspiring creator or filmmaker, if you're someone who's maybe fascinated by the evolving landscape of media, I'd like to hope that this episode, uh, would promise to maybe shed a light on the convergence between YouTube or just social media as a whole and traditional filmmaking. So, um, yeah, maybe we could start all the way back. Um, I'll start with you guys. Uh, I'm not going to go all the way back to 2012 for me, but, uh, what inspired you guys into creating content, uh, for social media and YouTube? What was your YouTube journey like? All right. Yeah. So I, uh, Right out of college, I graduated from, from USC. I was a screenwriting major. Uh, this is 2011. And I was working for a, uh, I was a customer service rep for a casting company in Los Angeles. Uh, it was miserable. Uh, imagine all of the technical difficulties we were just having, except it was with actors and, uh, and, and out of work actors. So they were, as, as soon as they got on the phone, they were already, upset because you know their careers weren't going tremendously well and so i was kind of dealing with that it was the pay was awful it was maybe just barely above whatever minimum wage was and i got a call one day from some friends of mine that i had previously worked with uh, the fine brothers uh they had a show called kids react that was sort of taking off at that time and they were expanding into teens react and eventually when I got there, elders react and seniors react or whatever it was. And they essentially said, Hey, we got a bunch of money from Google. We're part of this premium content initiative. Do you want to come work for us? And I immediately walked into the vice president's office at the casting company and just submitted my two weeks. Like I got the call on a lunch break and like I came back already and I was like, Hey, I'm out of here. <laughs> like, it was just <laughs> did not matter. I was like, I, I didn't even ask how much they were going to pay me. I didn't ask what the job was going to entail. Uh, I just said yes, because I knew that it was going to be so much better than the job that I had. Uh, and so I ended up the, a month later working for the Fine Brothers and they essentially gave me a bachelor's in YouTube. And this is 2012 YouTube. So probably around the same time, Frank, that you were getting into YouTube. And they had a show that they were filming called My Music. And it was quite an interesting concept, but really what I took away from that was sort of the inner workings of YouTube and specifically like the analytics side, like they were really diving into audience retention and SEO and all of those things before YouTube had a uh, audience development course that they would put people through. They sort of really cracked the code before uh, a lot of people like even understood what it meant to have like engagement and retention and all of those things that we all take for granted. Now they were so ahead of the curve on that stuff. And they had legitimately a, a like handbook that they put on Google drive that they like walked me through. And it was so specific in terms of like the titles, the thumbnails, 
uh, the tags, everything was so laid out for me. And I started to realize like, this was more than just, you know, uploading your video and hoping that good things happen. There was actually a process to it. And there was a system to, you know, the content still has to be good and it still has to engage people. But if you can make engaging content in addition to all of the sort of inner workings and, and, and optimization and that they had done, then it was going to have an even better chance uh, of spreading and getting popped up into people's search feeds and all that. And so I really, you know, look at them as the people that originally kind of got me to understand that YouTube was more than just making content, that there was actually sort of a, you know, a method to the madness. I'm just curious, how many uh, videos did you end up doing with them? I uploaded, I was their, their channel manager for exactly one year because that's when the money ran out from, from Google and they had to lay me <laughs> off with everyone else. Uh, I probably uploaded over 200 videos in a year for sure. It, it might have even been more than that because I was uploading all the My Music content and all the kids react, teens react uh seniors react all those those videos and some of the vlogs that they were doing um so it was like every week there were you know a couple of videos i think they were doing sunday and thursday uploads that i remember coming in early on those days and and i would have to be there as the the comments rolled in because people would you know the, the, all the teens and the kids they would read the comments of the videos that they were in because that's what you do when you're a kid and some of the con like comments this is before they had comment filtering by the way i would have to screenshot just some of the worst comments that were left and then obviously delete them. And so we would like screenshot them, put them in a drive, send it over to, to YouTube, to Google, to be like, Hey, we need com comment filtration. Uh, it, and we kind of take that for granted now because it seems like, Oh yeah, of course you'd have comment filtration. But back then it was like, anything goes you either had all comments on or all comments off. Mm. And so, um, yeah. Uh, and here's a little fun fact about, uh, kids react that, uh, I don't think Benny and Rafi have ever mentioned publicly. So I'm breaking some news here. Uh, the, the kids react idea came from the viral videos of people reacting to two girls, one cup. And they were like, those videos are like, like, obviously you can't have kids reacting to two girls, one cup, but they were like that, the concept of having reaction videos, that's where that came from. And so they were, there was, why don't we have kids react to like funny videos, viral videos, et cetera. And that's sort of how that concept was born. Um, so that's well, a little, in, in, little that. inside baseball that like, <laughs> I don't think anyone knew about. Yeah. Oh, wow. Damn. Um, I'm curious. Okay. Out of the 200, what's been your most memorable video and walk us through the development of that video from conception to upload. So with the fine brothers, I never got to produce any of the the video content. I only uploaded it. It wasn't until I got to the job after I was working for the Fine Brothers. I worked at a company that is now defunct called Break Media. Break Media became Defy Media and then they went bankrupt because they were doing some fraudulent stuff. Uh, I actually, when I was working at Break Media and Defy, I that's when I linked up with MatPat. And MatPat I kind of say that like the fine brothers gave me a bachelor's in YouTube and Matt Pat gave me a master's degree in, in YouTube because he was so like precise and detailed in terms of the algorithm. He was the first guy that like really kind of figured out that at least that I know about the algorithm and how like to, to use the algorithm to your advantage, to get more people to subscribe and watch. And we, we would do tests where we would upload the exact same video on like all of these different blank YouTube channels. And he would make small tweaks to each video in terms of like, okay, this video is going to have a different thumbnail, but everything else will be the same. This video is going to have a different uh, title, but everything else will be the same. It was sort of like taking the variables you would do in an, a science experiment and sort of putting that across like a dozen YouTube videos that were all the same video, but like had small tweaks just so he could figure out exactly what is the most important thing that the algorithm is paying attention to. Is it like the description? Is it the tags? Is it the title? Is it the thumbnail? Um, all of that kind of stuff. And so he, when I worked with him, you know, game theorists was like pretty, like he was getting, there was a couple hundred thousand subscribers. And within a year or two after, you know, I left defy, he had millions of subscribers and he's now probably regarded as like one of the most popular YouTubers in the world. 
And it was all because of that sort of like obsession and dedication to having like all of the little details and figuring it all out. Um, but while I was at Defy, uh, unrelated to, to working with MatPat, I uh, came up with a concept for a video uh, on Screen Junkies, which is a channel that they had owned at the time, uh, where we got uh, Morgan Fox was doing a press junket for, uh, I think it was called Last Vegas. That was the movie that he was promoting. And I, people, they were just fielding sort of like from anyone, like I was, again, I was a channel manager, so I wasn't really creating content at the time, but they just sort of solicited open ideas from anyone at the company to say like, all right, we're interviewing Morgan Freeman. What do you think would be like a fun thing to do with Morgan Freeman? And I think like a week or two before that is when, what does the Fox say? Got like really popular. It just like kind of blew up and it was this huge viral sensation. And I was sort of sitting at my desk thinking of ideas and I thought it would be funny if we could get Morgan Fox to read the lyrics to what does the Fox say? And I mean, Morgan uh, it, who did I say? You said Morgan Fox. Morgan Fox. <laughs> yeah, Morgan Freeman. <laughs> uh, so Morgan Freeman at this press junket, he did the lyrics to what is the, he read the lyrics yeah. to what is the Fox? This say? is a song called The Fox. The Fox. Yes. Dog goes wolf, cat goes meow, bird goes tweet, mouse goes squeak. The kidding. Car goes move, frog goes croak, elephant goes toot, duck says quack, fish goes blub, and the seal goes ow, 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 ow. There's a little bit more of them. <laughs> but there's one sound that no one knows. What does the fox say? A ring-a-ding-ding. A ring-a-ding-ding. -ding. A ring ding ding ring a ding 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 ring a ding 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 That's fantastic. That video ended up on Good Morning America. Like, it went mega viral. And so... At that point, I kind of realized I would like to be on the content creation side of things. I think I can kind of figure out or tap into something that might be viral. And uh, especially after, you know, I come up with that idea and then I'm basically shut out of the creative process for like months after that. It was very bizarre. Like I was so like it was so weird that I <laughs> had come up with this idea and then they just didn't want to like solicit any more ideas from me. And that was when I decided that I was going to leave and I joined up with uh, Simple Pickup and kind of worked with them and we created a company together. Uh, so that first idea, the the Morgan Fox, what is it reads? What does the Fox say? Morgan Freeman, what <laughs> reads? What does the Fox say? was like <laughs> the first thing that that uh, hit for me. And that was sort of when I got hooked. Yeah, I remember seeing that um, even prior to Jump Cut where we'd met. Um, you want to tell us a little about your jump cut experience? Well, let's, let's throw it to Colin first and then I'll come back to me about, okay. <laughs> yeah. Cause, 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 cause you and I worked at jump cut together. So I feel like we can talk about we that. Can, yeah. We can share some pretty interesting experiences there. Yeah. Colin, what got you into YouTube? Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, it's really interesting to hear, uh, <laughs> um, Sean, your, your journey, uh, because there's like, there's no one way to make movies and there's no one way to be a YouTuber or to engage with social media. And, um, yeah, there's this whole corporate side to YouTube that I, uh, I, I, I haven't participated in and it's pretty fascinating to me that it exists. And, um, you know, I, I, I definitely, I'm like an independent creator, right. And I'm just trying to get my stuff seen. So, um, you know, when I first got into filmmaking, I, uh, I found like an online community, like a forum, you know, back in the early 2000s where people were just sh showing their work and they were sharing it by uploading uh, Sorensen 3 encoded QuickTimes and hosting them on Angel Fire or whatever else, you know, Go GeoCities or whatever. I remember uh, those days. <laughs> and until like if, if something was too popular, the site would go down, you know, or like you just wouldn't have access. So I really remember seeing YouTube and feeling like the, the video quality was crap. Like it really was in the early days. It was so highly compressed and it did not compare to like the QuickTime videos I was now hosting on my own server, but there was a, you know, an impulse to share, you know, and, um, and, you know, my whole life, you know, uh, or my career quote unquote in film, I have idolized, uh, you know, the, the, the industry, the, 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 you know, theatrical distribution or legitimate, whatever. Um, and it's just so interesting how, and I'm glad we're talking about it because there is an interesting sort of oil and water relationship between, uh, between YouTube space and 
and like whatever the film industry um it, it would seem that they should be more compatible but there there seems a there's definitely like a hard divide here and i think a lot of people who i've admired including like freddie freddie w and um you know have have tried to you know make this leap or uh convert their popularity from one from from youtube for example to um yeah to film um for me it's it's just been interesting to reflect because essentially every good thing that has ever happened <laughs> in my career has been the result of posting my work online and pretty much on youtube um it started pretty early but i think Sintel was the big the turning point for me i was uh yeah living in amsterdam working at the blender animation studio uh, in 2009, 2010. And yeah, I got this incredible opportunity to direct a 15 minute animated short. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a short and that's all I've been doing is short films, you know, narrative shorts that aspire to be more than just YouTube videos, you know, um, a little less content, a little bit more narrative, you know, uh, cinematic ambition. What brings you to the land of the gatekeepers? I'm searching for someone. <laughs> A dangerous quest for unknown hunter. Been alone for as long as I can remember. At the time, I think there was like a YouTube front page that was shared globally. Like it wasn't so customized. We we hit the front page of YouTube um, and uh, and got you know over a million views in in the first week. Which I think at the time it wasn't the YouTube of today. Like that actually meant something. Um, and that's actually what led to my first uh, agent. Like, <laughs> I got an email from someone at WME as a result of this virality um, saying uh, something to the effect of, we think sort of like US-based representation would serve you well because they had no idea that I was an American. I just happened to... <laughs> <laughs> they just sent you like a form letter. They yeah, just, pretty like, much. <laughs> didn't even bother to like check, click, click on your profile. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> it's hilarious and so telling. Um, anyway, you know, and, and you're still with WME, right? Uh, no, I'm. You're not. I'm, okay, I'm now with CAA, but at no point in the in the whatever 15 years that I've had agents has any of them done anything for me. So, uh, like <laughs> well, if your agents are listening to this. You're, you're, uh, you're fired. You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I've been trying to knock on the door, you know, of Hollywood, but in the process, I've been so supported by whatever meager like uh, following on social media that I have had, you know, Twitter, Instagram, uh, and now YouTube, um, uh, I haven't really taken advantage of it in the way that I, I, I'm not trying to build an audience the way that perhaps I should be. Um, but just by doing work and putting it out, um, it, it's definitely led to beautiful things happening in my life. And it's very interesting, like just to say um quick story about Skywatch, like Skywatch, the short film was, was complete. And my managers were like, okay, let's, let's send it out to production companies, like on the DL, like let's create some whisper buzz about this incredible short, you know? And um that strategy was, I don't know, interesting, but just uh, did not produce any results. Um, had a lot of meetings, uh, so that was cool, but there was no buzz, there was no excitement, there was no, uh, that only happened as soon as I uploaded it to YouTube. And organically, you know, and 
I had some strategy, you know, I, I lined up some press. I, I, I did whatever I could to like blitz it out, you know? Um, but I'm just like a guy, you know, call, call um, it on. So I want to, I want to like explore that a little bit more. Yeah. And, and I have a theory of like why that is, because it's not just you who had to sort of upload something and get response before like the studio execs or the industry took notice. Think about what Ryan Reynolds did with Deadpool, where yep. they they uploaded that clip of Deadpool and it went super viral and people were flipping for it. People hear you talking like that, get everybody fired up. It's my shit. It's my shit. I said I hate some bananas. B a n a n a s. Oh, hello there. I bet you're wondering why the red suit. Well, that's so bad guys can't see me bleed. Hey! Let's hope these guys are wearing their brown pants. There's no easy way to say this. I'm pregnant, Trevor. Rich Corinthian letter. Bitch! At school is a for Shavar. Ow, 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 ow. Damn! I wish I was out. And here's a guy who has, at least at that point in his career, is a household name. Everyone knows who Ryan Reynolds is. He's a much bigger star now since then. But they essentially did the same thing where they uploaded it to the internet. And all of a sudden, the opinion changed because they saw the reaction. Right. And I think that that might just be a, that's just human nature, right? When yeah. It's social proof. When people see that something is successful or other people like it, they sort of get in line and they kind of think, oh, well, yeah, yeah, this is a great idea because it's at that point, it's obvious, right? When like hundreds of thousands or millions of people are reacting to something, then it makes their job a lot easier. Right. It's, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a data point that can be pointed to, you know, by the people who are, you know, scared about, the unknown. It's like, okay, well, there, there's an audience. I do think there's there was another aspect in in the case of Skywatch that was kind of interesting. It has to do with like organic, um, organically like getting to the the right people. Because uh, you know, my my managers are 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 great, but they don't that you know, they're not like they're not connected to everyone and they don't know who the right people are. They they'll They'll set up a meeting with this guy at this, you know, production company or, or you know, they'll use the, the connects they've got. But um, there was something about the the numbers game. I mean, once you're actually, uh, whatever, on the front page of, well, like short of the week and it's on Slash Film and stuff. I think it was on um, Reddit too, right? Yeah. Like people start sharing it and sending it to people and like, Oh, have you seen this? Da, 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 da. And, and like, it was a different group, you know, and, and different people who are like organically interested. Um, so it's, it's a, uh, it's a, it changes the, the dynamic from, Hey, would you please look at this thing to, Oh shit. Someone organically sent this to me. It's so cool. Let me, who's he repped by? Let's, let's meet with them, you know? Um, and that's uh that's powerful also. I believe that uh, Matt and Trey from South Park, they also kind of got their start in a similar way where they did a animated short of, I think it was Santa versus Jesus. And this is <laughs> like in like 96, you know, 95 in that area, email was just becoming a thing. And all of a sudden, like their little short film is getting emailed all around town. Oh, oh, oh. Whoa, whoa, now tell me what happened slowly. Okay, we're just building a snowman, and all of a sudden, he came alive. I told him, I said, don't put the magic hat on the snowman. And he did it anyway, and, and then he killed our friend Kenny, and now he's going to kill everybody. Did he look kind of like this? Yeah. 
Yeah, kind of like that. Immediately, people are like, who are these guys and how do we talk to them? And so this idea, I think, is exactly right, Colin, of the idea of something being sent to you because it's someone that thinks you might enjoy it because it's funny or entertaining or whatever versus a rep of someone sending you something because it's almost like I'm sending this to you because I want something from you, like a reaction right. from you, like a meeting from you, something right. Versus someone just saying, watch this thing. It's hilarious. There's no right. strings attached. And I think that does matter. Yeah. Yeah. And thank goodness. I mean, for YouTube and, 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 and the ability to do this now, you know, uh, it is, there's, is, the, I used to, you know, basically believe that the cream rises to the top, like by itself or organically or whatever. And, and that is a little, uh, simplistic and, and unfortunately not exactly how the world works. Um, particularly, you know, on YouTube where there is all the things you just said about the algorithm and, you know, gaming the system, or at least kind of knowing what you're doing and, uh, building a business model that really taps into, you know, how that system works. But I do also think there is a correlation at the very least. And if you do good work, even if you don't know what you're doing <laughs> and you throw it out there with enough consistency. And for me, consistency is not two uploads a week. It's, it's an upload every four years or whatever. <laughs> But you've you know? collaborated with some creators as well. You want to touch on that? Yeah, that's true. And, and that's true. I mean, um, so, well, some of my shorts, you know, or some of those shorts I got to direct or co-direct were on, you know, are highly visible in the Blender community and were on the Blender channel. And and like that has, you know, an audience and, and millions of subscribers. I got the chance to work with Zach King, you know, who's a pretty... Uh, I think he might be the number one TikToker, actually, uh, or maybe it's on Instagram. I don't know. He's got between him and Kabi Lame, right? Yeah, and then it's, Jimmy's uh, after him too. But yeah, yeah. You're for a long time. I mean, Zach was he was king for sure. Yeah, <laughs> pun intended. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and that was an incredible experience, and I got to make a narrative short uh, with him. This year, I wanted to tackle our biggest project to date: a western short film. It's interesting that the most successful, uh, in terms of YouTube views, um, has been commercials. I've, I've only done two animated spots for, uh, a company, but like, I guess they, I guess it's just a reflection of ad spend, <laughs> but they each have like 30, 40 million views on YouTube. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, I think I learned a lot, um, just getting to peek behind the scenes of Zach King's studio. Um, and, uh, man, he's built an empire out of around, um, essentially creating fun YouTube videos, you know, that are built on around this character and a visual conceit. As soon as you see Zach King, you like, you know, you're going to get, a, a like a piece of cotton candy, you know, visual trickery that it's going to be fun to watch and rewatch, uh, to figure out, like, to just enjoy, you know, how, how, uh, how does he do it? You know, it's, uh, it's great. Can you tell us a little bit about that one? Time traveling sheriff. Yeah. From um, concept to, to upload that'd be, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating story. You got to shoot on the back lot, the whole nine. Um, sure. there's a lot of, there's a lot of blurred lines in that one in terms of what we're talking about with traditional filmmaking and, you know, with YouTube. Yes. But, should we, should I throw it back to you guys and then we could ping pong back and forth since I've been talking for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> We're all insecure about talking too long at this point. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'd love to talk about more of like, I mean, Zach, Zach's a very interesting creator in the sense there's a lot of traditional, um, there's still a lot of traditional values and foundations that play to yeah. it. Right. Versus, you know, I've, I've done <laughs> a lot of run and gun, even vlog style videos that are, you know, you're just spitballing, throwing it out there. Whereas that particular video seemed like it took, you know, a certain level 
of, of time to develop and craft, right? Great point. Yeah. So Zach has, um, it seems like, uh, you know, he, he's got his, like his bread and butter stuff. He's got his sponsored uh, deals stuff that is like uh, really where maybe the money comes in. And then he's kind of got his passion projects, I think. And I think he's always had, I don't know him very well, but ambition on the on the narrative filmmaking side of things. And uh, in fact, I think he's got at some point um, a deal with Amblin uh, for some some particular project or, or something. He's released children's books, like so. He's got uh, a, a lot of threads going. The time traveling sheriff is is part of uh, kind of a series of sh- of narrative shorts that I think he are more ambitious, uh, not sponsored, or if they are, they only cover a fraction of the, of the budget. And, um, he had a really great success with, uh, this, the short stranded and it's definitely, um, it's still based on, you know, the familiar Zach King character, but it's a longer form, you know, kind of, uh, story with the beginning, middle and end. Um, and, uh, it, it's, it's fun, but it's a little bit less bite-sized and a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, of a, of a media experience. You can hit play and sit back and watch. Um, and so, yeah, I ended up meeting Zach, uh, when I was actually looking for cameo options, um, for Skywatch, um, before Jude Law entered the picture. <laughs> and, um, he, so he saw the short he was really impressed. We started talking and, um, a few different potential projects sort of came up in conversation, but it was like a slow motion conversation. And actually the time traveling sheriff was something that I, I went and I met, uh, him and his team and his writer, um, and had a great brainstorming session and it seemed to like gain some steam and then it went away. And then, uh, over a year passed and, uh, he was like, I still want to do this. Are you game? You know, um, and I was like, ah, yeah, I was really freaking pumped uh, because I just don't direct very often and I want to be a director. And here's someone who's uh, going to trust me uh, to bring a, a story to life. And he's got a, you know, Zach has got a massive audience. It's a huge. Um, yeah, it's a, it's it's a lot of trust and it's a lot of uh, what a cool opportunity, you know, um, and the Western in particular. uh that genre, I mean, the concept was very much uh, inspired by uh, Back to the Future Part. Was it three? I just, <laughs> I literally just watched that last week. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love Back to the Future. I love all three. I grew up on those movies. When this baby hits eighty-eight miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious shit. <laughs> You know, the year prior, uh, myself and and um, the the co writer, uh, I think Andrew Gerlicker, um, but I could be misremembering, um, came up with this conceit around this cowboy hat that is the device that teleports you back in time. So you take in, you're, you're in the same space physically, but you go back uh, 150 years or whatever, um, and uh, that was just such a fun high concept and building a, an emotional story around that. Like 
I have my own taste when it comes to shorts or, or, you know, what kind of films I want to make. So I wanted to make something that was fun, high concept, had some action and hijinks, but also, you know, had an emotional core, had a, a strong heart, you know, might have, ha have a moral at the end. So I, you know, I got to, um, write and revise and, and, and pitch and, and workshop it with him. And then, uh, the, the prospect of, of producing it, um, with Nate Norell, uh, on his team who, you know, was really familiar with how to put together, uh, you know, like a, a one minute, basically single shot video, but like, uh, a, a full on short multiple days of shooting, you know, with, uh, I wanted to get an experienced DP, um, and experienced department heads like wardrobe, like if you're going to tell a story that takes place, you know, in the old West, like you need to populate that world with believable, you know, people. So casting and, and, um, and dress them, you know, wardrobe, uh, set design, props, yeah. hair and makeup, like all yep. of it, that, it all, it makes a huge so difference. So important. Exactly. And I wanted to be grounded. I wanted to be more grounded than anything Zach King had ever done. <laughs> and I even, um, yeah, we had a conversation about it. Like even when it came to his performance, I was like, so how comfortable are you really dropping in? You know what I mean? <laughs> it doesn't need to be like this. Look, we've all got insecurities, but you're taking yours out on us. Yeah. Whatever you say, Sheriff. Those people, they were scared. They were desperate for help. There was no one to stand up for them. I'm not gonna let you keep terrorizing people, Milton. I'm really proud of, uh, I mean, we, we pulled off a lot for a little and, um, people really came out of the woodwork to help out on a Zach King project. Um, and, uh, was that, was that the biggest project that you've directed in terms of, uh, the amount of people that were working on it outside of the, your, your day job, uh, to that point? Um, honestly, I think Skywatch was a bigger crew ultimately, but you know, I worked on that for six years or whatever. Um, and it touched a lot, you know, visual effects, for example. Um, but it was very similar level and compressed. So it had an intensity about it. And certainly on set, it felt most the most legit on set experience, just because there's freaking horses and extras and um, an Alexa and like, I don't know. Yeah, it just it felt like, ooh. This you, know, is you, you know, when you feel like you've made it, at, like when you're shooting something is when you have like star trailers. You know? Yeah, <laughs> and you're like, like the talent is in a trailer, so you right. like go, go in there and talk to them. You're like, okay, this is yeah. real. This is one real day. Now. One day yeah. I'll get there. <laughs> yeah. And which studio lot was it? Um, this is Sable Ranch. Yeah, so it wasn't a studio lot. We looked at some studios, uh, some like you know backlot kind of situations, but this is a, a ranch that has um, some great locations. Yeah. Is that wow. is that out in Hidden Valley? Uh, I'm not sure what valley it is. Is it, is it north of LA? Yeah. Is it? Uh, it's pretty close though. It's like four, 40 minutes north of there. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. 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 I uh, I know that they've shot a, lot, a bunch of stuff up there. That it's like there and and like Malibu State Park are like the two places that they shoot it's a lot in of Santa westerns. Clarita. It looks like. Yeah. Um, and actually, that was like the biggest uh, the biggest like producing hurdle, uh, was finding a location. Finding, location scouting is so important. Yeah. So important. We, we definitely checked out a few different Western towns, which was like super fun, but like the logistics of getting a crew of 40. Yeah. To. Yeah. Trans long transportation. Yep. And then also you have to be aware, especially in California of like, are you near in like an air base or an airport? Because mm -hmm. you're going to be constantly stopping when there's like a plane overhead, <laughs> when you're in like the middle of a take, which is just a nightmare. I mean, we like to get, it's like, I wrote a horse into the script. It's like, how many horses do we need? How do we get the horses? Yeah. 
<laughs> here. Horse logistics is like yes. a whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and then also, did you guys have to have someone from like the ASPCA, like to make sure that no animals were harmed in the making of this film? Did you guys go to that extent or what was sort of like, I don't did you have like, do you have stunt so. coordinators? Did you, I have, don't know. Yeah. I hired, uh, I, I, and I don't even know if he charged, so I have to, or if so, it was like a, just a, an insulting rate, but, um, the, 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 uh, stunt coordinator from everything everywhere all at once, uh, either volunteered or helped out <laughs> or, or whatever, um, on, on one day where, where Anna, this, I mean, she's like seven you know, is being dragged by her hair into this, you know, into the, uh, the dirt road by the, the villain Milton. And, uh, that was, uh, required some rigging and harness. And, um, he had an incredible system. It's actually something he's always wanted to do. He sent me a video of him, like dragging his, like his nephew, <laughs> in the most violent way across his backyard. And it was like, Oh my God, can we do that? Um, yeah. So, so cool. Do you guys have um, to have a, like a tutor on set as well? We did. Yep. And it was in the height of COVID. So, you know, um, and we had an armor type cause there were weapons on set. So yeah, it, it's just like one thing leads to, to the next. And I, my impression is, that no Zach King video had ever been produced as legitimately. Um, you know, it's more of a run and gun approach usually mm -hmm. and smaller team. Uh, the DP may not be familiar with like how things are done in film and they might be just more like content guys who have a great eye, Yep. you know, and are used to like cranking stuff out, but maybe like the whole, for example, we scheduled the day around the position of the sun and on uh, looking at this, uh, this location uh, at every point, the sun was behind the actors on both sides, <laughs> which was like, I mean, I didn't know that that's how that, that seems to me like a continuity problem, but uh, this DP Adon was so, um, specific and adamant about what he wanted and it's beautiful like anytime you've got kind of a rim light situation you know or you're just not uh photographing the dumb side right light wise um that that's one thing that like when i watch a lot of these directors commentaries is yeah. is if you have a great dp yeah you can save so much time and headache by just deferring to them yeah. And, and especially I was watching Frank Darabont's director's commentary and amazingly enough, Shawshank Redemption was the first film that he'd ever directed. And he had what? Roger, he had Roger Deakins as his DP, which I mean, to be a first time film director and have Roger Deakins as your DP, he Deakins would just step in and, cause they did a lot. He was talking about this in the, the commentary where they had a lot of shots of in the mess hall at, at Shawshank and they did, he didn't want it to look all the same, right? Like all the right. coverage to be the same. And so Deacons would just step in and be like, Hey, listen, um, I'm just going to do a one take and I'm just going to like come in and you just let the actor do his thing. Because at this point, all the other ca characters have been established. So we don't need to get coverage of all the guys at the table. You know, we'll just come in on Morgan Freeman's face and he would be like, okay, yeah, like we'll try that. And of course it works, right? Because these, yeah. these DPs, especially the experienced ones, they know what they're talking about and they will save you so much goddamn time and, and like wasted energy and effort. And they'll save your day because what a lot of people don't realize is that the, the biggest thing when you're shooting something that is, that is high budget, high pr production value is, is daylight and, and being able to make your hours, especially if you're doing something that's union. And if you go over time, it's going to cost you a, a ton of money. And if you have a, an experienced DP, that's just going to step in and be like, don't worry, I got this. I know exactly what we need to do. And it's going to be quicker and it's going to be fine in the, in the edit. You just got to defer to that person. And so as a director, you're thinking like, Oh man, continuity, like how's it going to cut together? And DP is like, no, 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 no. I got this. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. Like, <laughs> and you just defer to them and it works out. 
It was a great uh, collaboration, actually, and we did some actually pretty thorough previs. Um, I did a, a like a a three D scan essentially of of the location on one of our scouts, and then I was able to drop in some virtual cameras and CG actors and, and work with the DP to kind of figure out uh, how to how to cover certain moments, um, and uh, that became a shot list, which became our schedule and. Um, that was a really fun process. Yeah. How many shooting days did you have? Um, so it, it's kind of interesting. We really wanted to milk and juice the, <laughs> the, the Western location. Um, so we gave like all of our time there and then had like one day for everything else. So I think it was, uh, I think it might've been four, possibly five days. Um, but it felt like, uh, really short changed the um the sort of studio lot uh or the studio uh location we were just flying and um the last shot that we got on set was the last shot of the movie and we were just i had like i don't know three takes it was supposed to be like six shots and it was exactly what you just said sean where we just had no time and we had to on the fly be like okay it's got to be one shot what's what is it um we got to get out of here <laughs> and like it's the end of the movie god damn it um and uh i think i think we pulled some, uh, something off it was uh definitely a compromise though <laughs> yeah I, it, it, you know the other thing that i took away from Darvon's commentary is when he said you know when the time is of the essence shoot the star so mm -hmm. shoot the person who is probably the person that you're not going to have the ability yep. to, to do pickups with or reshoots with like get that person in the can and yep. then you can work around everyone else. hundred percent. And I guess I would, you know, um, recommend to myself in the future, not to put the last shot of the movie at the end, uh, because <laughs> it's, it's an important one. It's yeah. like more important than the connective tissue. So, you know, take your time getting that last shot when you have a little more, wiggle room in the schedule and, uh, compromise elsewhere. <laughs> yeah. Just get your, uh, your, B, your B camera team to go, go shoot some establishing shots, uh, you know, some other time and just right. make sure you get all the, all the right. important stuff in the can. Yeah, totally. I'm curious. Was there ever talk of potentially adapting it as a series or, or a movie? Yeah, I, um, this is something that, I would be very curious, maybe, you know, one day when our po podcast is popular and so, so popular, uh, we could so get next, Zach on. next month, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, um, uh, I see so much potential for that. I think this is a great, you know, of, uh, I think Zach is, and I don't want to speak too much for him, but I think he's wanted to, you know, um, figure out how to like, uh, how to how to translate his character, you know, and his brand to a, a sort of a feature narrative kind of structure or show. I don't know. Um, and I felt like we we found a way of. Um, so here's here's just one thing to say about it is that Zach King usually can do anything, right? He can do anything. He's a magician. Um, in this case, we stripped away his powers. This is a big argument, a, a very interesting philosophical debate that I got in with him. It was and is so open. So I'm, I was so excited by how down he was. But really, if if you can do anything, the stakes are very low. You know, you're just kind of waiting as the audience to see what and how he's going to get out of it. But you're never actually feeling like he's in peril. So um, the decision was made that the hat this time traveling thing is the only device. It's the only kind of source of magic. And I think it was successful personally. And I think because of that, there's a, there's a whole lot of fun that could be, I, I think it's a better setup for, for a narrative, um, you know, longer form. And we talked about it loosely and Zach was loosely, um, excited about it, but it's, uh, it's totally the ball is in his court. Like I would love to, develop and 
write and, you know, pitch <laughs> a longer form version of the time traveling sheriff. Um, it sounds but, like uh, you, you should do like a, uh, a five obstructions with Zach. Have you, have you guys seen that documentary with Lars von Trier and, and Jorgen Leth, uh-uh. where, where essentially they do five different like short films, but each short film has a rule that they're not allowed to, to do this one thing. I'm not going to spoil the whole thing, but I cool. feel like it'd be similar to what you were just saying, where it's like, we're going to limit him to yeah. like, this hat is the only, you know, magic element that you can do is like, you can do like a series of like, you know, essentially these are the rules that you cannot break when you make this, this film. And then you shoot the frustration of him trying to figure out how to <laughs> get around it. I love that. That's really cool. I'm going to have to check that out as uh, as reference. And maybe I need to um <laughs> like take some initiative. And um but I love that question Frank and and honestly, anytime I make a short these days, you know, I'm definitely I I do love making shorts, but I I want to get into features and uh obviously Skywatch is a proof of concept and I I was definitely rattling in the back of my head, like this would be really cool to to make bigger. It seems like there was something there um, when when you first told me about it. I, I started thinking. I was like, if Colin was to develop this as a series, at, at the end of it, I was like, there could be a a, a limited series at least uh, for yeah the amount of potential. There's a lot of different things about it. If you haven't seen it, I'll cut away to it, or I'll send a link down below. Uh, highly recommend to check that out. Um, but yeah, that was, that was a really, do you, would you say that was like a good exercise? How, Cause that took like a couple months, right. To develop and then upload all nine. Oh yeah. It actually was, um, probably closer to like eight, eight or nine months. Wow. Yeah. It was okay. a big deal. Uh, initially it was going to be cheaper and quicker and it, it did balloon. And there were like a couple junctures where we kind of went went to Zach and and we're like, okay, which version of the movie are you interested in making? You know, like more of this down and dirty thing, or if you are down, like here's our pitch for the more ambitious version. And to his credit, he was uh, he was really supportive. Uh, like um, he could he could feel the enthusiasm. I think um, Nate and I Nate. Narelle, you know, and I were, were really tr- just trying to make this thing awesome. And I honestly, I don't know if it was a worthwhile investment, like in a, when it comes to like looking at the performance, like he has 30 second videos that have, you know, hundreds of millions of views. Right. And this one only has less than 5 million on, on YouTube, which for him is, might be a, a, a failure. I don't know. Uh, it's it's very small compared to most of his stuff. So I don't know how he uh, sort of sees the reception. Um, I, I, uh, I think I learned some things. I think the opening is very weak and doesn't do a good job of hooking people. Um, so I would, you know, I look back at it and I have some notes for myself. But yeah, it, it ended up being um, a much more ambitious project than it was originally conceived. <laughs> What else did you learn from it? Honestly, uh, well, on a personal level, I have never had a more stark example of myself making projects into my higher power. Uh, I obsessed about this project. You know, I was kind of a director for hire and and um, given the keys to like a really cool opportunity, right? And I wanted to do my best, but I really overdid it and I overdo it in general. And I, um, sacrificed a lot that I think was me sort of, um, my need for control and my need to like every project I ever do. I'm like, this is the thing that's going to like save me, you know, from my, fate of being, um, irrelevant or something. (laughs) (laughs) And, um, so my personal life suffered, my health suffered. And at the end of the day, it's a Zach King video. It's, uh, he released it, 
uh, I'm glad you know about it, Frank, but most people like in my life, it, you know, uh, it didn't really, uh, change anything for me. Um, my reps didn't do anything like, you know, it's not mine. Um, so I think just on a personal level, I, I want to be able to do great work and be passionate and excited about it and work collaboratively with uh, cool people and, and take these sorts of opportunities um, without losing myself <laughs> in the process, which is something that I, I tend to do. We're a very niche group of filmmakers. Uh, I, I, at least there's only a handful I can count uh, off the top of my head where we have worked. It was like a fine line between working with creators and then working even on a studio level, right? Mm. Um, so that feeling of ownership, I, I understand that a hundred percent because, uh, you know, we've worked with creators that are, their audiences are, they're insane. Right. But you're going, yeah. I mean, you're going a hundred miles per hour, uh, all you can to, you know, not only make, meet the standards of what a successful viral video is for them. Right. But to like actually move something that's that's huge, right? Not I'm not even I talking mean, about the money, the budget or, or everything, but I'm talking about like the whole operation. Frank, you got to talk about your <laughs> beast experience. Yeah, we're burying the lead here. You've worked with the biggest creator out of any of us. <laughs> yeah. I, I, we should have <laughs> I feel like that's a whole in a way I think that's a whole pod in itself. We're almost an hour yeah. in and Jimmy, I mean working with Jimmy is is uh I mean it's 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 definitely a Hold on for the for the listeners that that glossed over that Mr. Beast is <laughs> is is Jimmy his that's his real name it's not a, Mr. Beast is not on his birth certificate so <laughs> so when, when when Frank is referring to Jimmy he's talking about Mr. Beast and I just want everyone to know and if you don't know who Mr. Beast is just Google him and you'll see how, like this this man is uh, he is the king of YouTube and and Frank worked there for a long period and. So many videos produced so many videos, but particularly the, the Antarctica one, I think would, if you want to talk about it, like really <laughs> illustrate the point that you were just making. <laughs> yeah. We just landed in Antarctica and we're going to survive the next 50 hours here. We're literally at the bottom of the globe at the coldest place on earth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would say like, let me, let me, let me set yeah. you up, Frank. Go this, for it. Which is, yeah, go for it. Look, most YouTube videos and creators that you work with, if you have a budget of a few thousand dollars, you're probably ahead of like 99.9% .9 of creators. Okay. Um, Jimmy is one of the few YouTubers, in my opinion, who's not really making YouTube content any longer. He's making essentially television episodes that are on YouTube. Yep. And, and with that comes a higher budget and, and, and by orders of magnitude, even order over stuff that probably Colin and I work with, but also the production team, the is, is like a small army of, of people. And it's, it's the closest thing to television or film that I think anyone on YouTube is currently reaching right now. And, and part of that is because there's an economy of scale issue that happens with YouTube where the reason why you can't shoot something for eight months and then release it on YouTube is that you're never going to recoup your costs. And Jimmy does not have that issue because he has so many viewers and he has these brand deals that enable him to make large scale projects. And so Frank w came on what a couple years ago, like two years ago, Correct. Work, yeah. working with, with Mr. Beast and Frank was hired as a producer to execute on these massive projects. And so this is not just like, oh, we're going to film something in a warehouse, you know, for a day or two. It's like, we're going to go to Antarctica and we're going to like bring some huge YouTubers to Antarctica and we're going to film, you know, on Antarctica, which by the way, like I, I'm not, I'm not even sure how many real films have ever shot on Antarctica, let alone like a YouTube channel. And so the logistics that Frank's been part of it, it, Frank, you're basically making television. It's just that people don't realize how much goes into it. Yeah. Well, as of the, t the, 
airing of this episode, um, they are, there's been a deal. Uh, I kind of knew about it a while back, but Amazon has now brokered a deal with Jimmy uh, to have a, or with Mr. B, I should say, <laughs> with, uh, yeah, making a, a television series for, for Amazon. And there were other streamers that were courting this, right? And at the end of the day, uh, went with a deal where we had, or he had most creative freedom. I say we, <laughs> but it's, it's at the end of the day, it's Jimmy's call. It's Mr. Well, it's, that's you know, his, it's like when I channel. watch the Dodgers games and, and we win, yeah, yeah, I'm, exactly. I'm part of that. It's, it's <laughs> us. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I, I just, uh, kind of rewind just a tiny bit. Um, I looked at YouTube YouTube art to filmmakers are, are what street artists are to gallery painters, right? Jimmy is a high end street artist. He's probably like the shepherd fairy of street art, right? Mm. He or, or Banksy or even Banksy. Yeah. Or even Banksy. It, uh, yeah. He's the biggest one for sure. And the way he operates, there's departments, you know, uh, that you, you're, you're always, you're, kind of talking with, you know, there's like a thumbnail department, for example, that doesn't, you know, there, there's no such thing as a thumbnail department in films. <laughs> you know, you're talking to like five other people who come up with, you know, different colors and like different layouts and even like the storyboards of, of, of a video or, you know, the certain beats of what, what we look for in a video. Um, there's a lot of different ingredients that kind of come to this, but uh, the way Jimmy kind of had it laid out, it's, it's, it's fucking brilliant. He's, he's a true innovator in this way. There's like a level of, of YouTube that he understands that I don't think a lot of people they'll maybe in a couple of years, we're starting to see a little bit more of this. There's now certainly been a thing called the, the Mr. Beast beastification of YouTube. But I, I will say that he runs a media company very much like the beginnings of, uh, I mean, if I compare it or whatever, even like someone like Disney, right? Like I was, I was reading his bio years and years ago and the way he was thinking about animation at the time and all that. I mean, it sounded kind of bonkers, but the way Jimmy's kind of looked at the distribution of YouTube, he's very much in, in the same line of it, whether he knows it or not. Uh, but yeah, that said, uh, the budgets, everything is bigger. Everything is uh, pretty much in line with a TV show or even with some of the stuff we did like Antarctica, it's almost like fear factor in a way. Um, but it's, there's still a lot of heart in the spirit of YouTube when we're crafting these videos, right? We really don't have a script to work off of. We have kind of an outline of what we want to do. It's my job to kind of come in and say, all right, here's the playground. Here's the sandbox that we're going to play in. Just let's stay in the sandbox. Right. And we've got this amount of time to play in the sandbox. And uh, not only just in Antarctica, you know, to do that with all these other $1 versus million dollar, what have you, uh, th there's multiple sandboxes there. Right. And um, yeah, I can touch on that a little bit. <laughs> there's so many routes to take here, but um, the freedom, I'll say this, the freedom that I felt working on a Mr. Beast video, even on a, you know, you're, we're dealing with major budgets here is much higher than the freedom that I felt working on a studio level, if that makes any sense, where we would creatively problem solve things like pretty much on the spot, right? You're kind of, you're almost like playing jazz, you know, with, with Jimmy, the talent, everybody, like everybody at the same time, we're all kind of doing this at the same time. You know, my very first video with him was, uh, we gave away, I gave away a, a, a I gave away my hundred millionth subscriber an island in the Bahamas. <laughs> and um, it sounds silly, but it's true. I mean, it ended up happening. And um, the level of improvisation there that I kind of brought to the table and some of the challenges that we had to go through were, were pretty high. You know, they encouraged that. Um, whereas if I was to do that as a TV show, that had to been, there would probably be a lot more creative say as to what we could do, right? But even you know, this was a major budget, but even then, like when we were shooting there, we we're kind of like, we we're playing jazz. We we're like, oh, maybe this could be better. This could, you know, here's a loose idea of what we wanted to do here, but this is a better idea, right? We're kind of like feeling the energy as we're shooting. That was cool to me. I liked, I, that's, 
that's that for me, the action is the juice, right? I like to be in production to creatively problem solve some of these, these things, even in Antarctica, like it sounds crazy doing it down there because of course, you know, you're in a very extreme environment <laughs> and the nearest hospital is a five hour plane ride away. <laughs> so the room for error has to be very, very small. Right. Um, so and, and there's a I would say calculation to something like that, right? Part of the part of the reason why you might might have had more freedom on a Mr. Beast uh, production than like a studio production is that the person signing the checks is at the end of the day it's Mr. Beast and he cares so much more about the end product, the video itself, the audience that's going to be watching it and he has a creative mind versus someone who's at the studio they care most about the budget, right? And staying on budget. And so making sacrifices for creativity uh, for the almighty dollar, it's always going to be the almighty dollar, right? Like Jimmy is more like, oh, okay, well, if this is going to cost a hundred thousand, 200,000 more to get this video to be 10% better, he's going to do it. Right. And I think Correct. that is that operating from, from that point of view is going to be such a better experience for a producer or a director because he'll always find a way to like get you more cash because he wants the video to be better. That's the bottom line there is does this make the video better? That's, I mean, that's what we always think about uh, for, for every segment, everything. Does this move the video forward? Is this better, better content or greater content? To kind of talk, talk about what you were just saying earlier, Colin, about like, there's a level of ownership that you want to feel with a project. Um, mm -hmm. Antarctica was fun for me per personally because like uh, I'm very much an outdoorsman. I like to I like to do crazy shit. It is cold out here. It's like probably 15 degrees. Okay. <laughs> Um, but there is another, the next level to that for me, uh, was actually helping people and the level of impact of actually seeing people's lives that change right in front of us was, was pretty surreal, right? Uh, for the blind video, for example, I know there was a little bit of, a you know, uh, backlash on Twitter and all that bullshit. Um, I, I, I kind of think that's, I think a lot of that shit's bullshit. It's just YouTube. There's a lot of trolls and stuff out there, but uh, it will never change like the life that I just saw. You know, this, there was like a 21 year old kid who was going to go blind in one eye if he didn't get this uh, specific surgery. And, uh, you know, not only did we change, you know, his, his living standards and whatnot, I think we gave him, we ended up giving him a Tesla and stuff, but we literally changed his life. Like he's now, he now can, can see a hundred percent. He's now able to drive. Right. It was like, we just literally like how, like helped so him in a way cool, that, man. you know what I mean? Like there's that, he, I don't know how to explain it, but there's that level of like real yeah. change in the world that we made. That's bigger than, you know, filmmaking or storytelling, whatever we, we call this, but there's that level of change that we've seen. And even with cataracts, right? I, I felt like I became like a, for the first, this is, this is another cool thing about working with Jimmy. When you're, doing, when you're doing a video, you're going all out. Like you're almost becoming a method actor for the video, right? For So for this particular video, um, as a producer, I wanted to know everything there, there, can, there could be to know about um, about eyes in general, right? I felt like I became a, uh, like an eye doctor for legit three, four months. <laughs> an ophthalmologist. <laughs> an ophthalmologist, exactly. I, <laughs> I talked, I consulted with so many ophthalmologists. Um, I didn't know there were like, there are people that are, are very specific. They're specialists for uh, anything that's like on the front of your eye. The, the, the more difficult it gets, it gets uh, more closer to the retina, the more difficult the procedure uh, it, it would become right. Like if retina, if you, someone had retinitis pigmentosa, which was something we looked into because we wanted to figure out a way to, uh, there's one person that we found that needed very severe, um, intensive, pretty much replacing an eye with a mechanical eye. And, um, this, this stuff is still being tested. You know, I reached out to Harvard, 
I got to reach out with a whole bunch of different organizations that are, you know, uh, trying to make some of these miracle procedures happen. And so, uh, but what I found was uh, in this particular video, I didn't know that most blindness, 80, 80 to 90% of blindness is, is due to cataracts and people simply can't afford them. And those ca cataract surgeries can start at sometimes 500 bucks, you know, sometimes a thousand. And then even third world countries are like 50 bucks or a hundred. There are people out there that, that cannot get this solved for them. So we figured that was probably the best approach to do it. So and I, pr I promise you that. these people that are getting these life-changing surgeries, they don't care that it was for a, a YouTube video or they just, all they know is that someone came in and they provided this for me and it changed exactly. my life. And I like the, all the cynicism about, you know, the reason why he did it or you're doing it for views or whatever. I promise you it, that does not matter if you talk to these people. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. They, and, and you, yeah. Frank, uh, did a lot of the finding of these people, right? Um, on Correct. GoFundMe and other th sources. GoFundMe, there was a, a number of different organizations that we reached out to um, yeah. and uh, even locally uh, just called up a whole bunch of different uh, ophthalmologists throughout North, North Carolina and South Carolina hmm. uh, before I started reaching out to you know institutions. We ended up partnering with Duke um, for Satchel's uh, particular uh, video or his uh, segment. Wait. I met another young man named Satchel. Uh, did they tell you I was going to be here? No. Good. Oh he had poor vision from birth and almost lost his entire vision after a go-karting accident. All I see is like blur in color. I can barely see like the shapes. Obviously you can't drive, right? No, I cannot. And this is the real reason why we're doing this. Blindness can take away parts of your life. And you know, I want to drive since I can't drive around just at home. Good luck. We'll, we'll see you after the procedure. Yeah, he, he needed a corneal transplant. And uh, he was out in Greensboro, North Carolina. I was very lucky to kind of find him. He was very close proximity to where we were. So, uh, but we found a lot of different cases. Um, but that was that was a video that felt I had the most impact in people's lives and uh, felt a genuine change. It kind of affected me. I got teary eyed a couple times uh, throughout the, the the production of that. And uh, I'm grateful for that experience. It was it definitely changed me as a person. Um, I mean, it felt, it felt very good to, to really, you know, change lives on that level. And, um, yeah, there is, there's a lot of other philanthropic things. Uh, he's got a whole department for that, or he's got a whole separate channel for that matter for, for, for philanthropy. Um, that is something I, I, I believe in, uh, Darren and, uh, there's a filmmaker there, Dan Mace who's really leveled up, uh, the game for, for YouTube specifically with, with, uh, with Jimmy. I wish everything, if I'm being honest, I wish everything was done, shot by Dan Mace. This school in Cameroon has extremely dilapidated and hazardous classrooms. No running water or electricity and only a single toilet shared by over 3,000 kids and staff daily. And what's even worse is despite the school's mission to empower young girls and provide them a safe haven from domestic abuse and other challenging conditions, many children cannot enroll because of overcrowding and deteriorating conditions. So in this video, we're going to rebuild this school from this to this this to this and this to this to give these kids a better opportunity at life. There is a lot of room for where I see YouTube heading thanks to Jimmy. And uh, that gave me a lot of hope actually in a lot of ways. Uh, I mean, I've been in the YouTube game <laughs> a little over 10 years now. Sean, we could talk a little bit about our jump ex experience, but like you, I think your analogy with you, working with the fan, uh, the fine brothers where that was like your, your bachelors. Um, I, I think jump cut felt was very much the same line with me that felt like my, ma my, my bachelors. And then Jimmy was, you know, kind of a master's doctors. <laughs> it's a doctor for sure. Of, yeah. of, of YouTube for PhD. sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I, you know, what, one thing that I, in terms of the differences between YouTube and filmmaking is I think, just in the past few months, we've seen a lot of YouTubers have even Matt Pat, which I'd mentioned that I'd work with and I'd learned from, he's stepping down from being, you know, the face of some of his channels and kind of taking a, a 
producerial sort of godfather role. And I think that's something, whereas you look at filmmaking, Clint Eastwood is still making films. He's still directing. Scorsese is still directing. You've got these people that are in their 80s and 90s that are still going strong. And I think part of that is the economics of YouTube and sort of the algorithm and how once you get on the treadmill of YouTube, it's almost impossible to get off without losing something, whether it's losing your audience or losing your subscribers or losing your views or, you know, whatever the momentum is that's built into this algorithm. It, there's no, there, we have TV seasons where, you know, you could go a couple of years in between seasons of euphoria and everyone will watch season two of euphoria. They'll come back to it where if you stop uploading content on YouTube, people start to lose interest or they forget about you or you're not rewarded in the algorithm or you're, video doesn't pop up in their feed. And I think this is a detriment to YouTube creators where they don't feel like they can take time off without losing the living and, and the momentum that they've built with their audience, um, which is not the case with, with filmmaking uh, or, or television. And I think this is something that is going to be a long-term problem for YouTube when all your best content creators uh, are essentially retiring before they hit like 40. Uh, you know, Tom Scott kind of started the trend, but it's something that we're going to keep seeing until they can figure out a way to allow some of these guys to take a break and um, not get penalized for it. Where do you so think it's heading, John? I don't, I, I can't exactly say where I think it's heading in terms of like what content will be popular. Um, I, I'm glad that some of the prank content that we kind of came up in that generation is kind of going away. Although I see some of it still, so it's just like that mean spirited kind of content that gets views. I think if Jimmy is to be an influence on YouTube to get people to do videos that actually make you feel good and aren't like doing things at the expense of people, I think that's a positive, but in terms of, the content creators themselves, I think we're going to see a lot more burnout. Um, you know, when I worked for the Fine Brothers, they were at the offices, I, I would say 75% of their, their day was spent at the office. Um, and that's just not sustainable long term. Uh, you, you've got to be able to earn a living and also have that work life balance. You know, Colin, you kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier where you said that you are so into doing this video for Zach that you were kind of losing sort of sight of yourself and your personal life and all that. And I think that is not only to, to the detriment of you as a human, but also I think you're going to get worse content and, and you're going to be not as creative if you are so tied up in this idea that this, this video has to be the thing that like gets me to X, Y, Z. You got to operate from a place of having a stable life that this is just one part of your, your, your life. This is one element where your brain is freed up to be as creative and, and uh, create an environment for people that's enjoyable to be around and you get your best work. Sometimes I think when you're most relaxed and at ease. And my fear is that these YouTubers that are, you know, Jimmy, I think right now is completely dedicated. He's all in, but is that going to be the case in five years or 10 years? I, I can't say that that will be the case. I think he might burn himself out. And, um, I think that is to everyone's detriment. I'll, I'll agree to, I think there's, there's definitely a lot of truth to that. There's certainly a high level of burnout that I've, I've noticed from, from other creators. Um, I mean, there's an exodus happening right now you, you, that you had mentioned. Um, I think Jimmy is all in for the rest of his life, if I'm being honest. <laughs> I think he's he's been doing this since, I think, 11 or 12. You think he'll be, uh, you know, 70 and uh, cranking out videos? He is built different uh, <laughs> as, as a creator. I mean, even as a human. Uh, he's the Tom the Brady of, of YouTube. The guy's the guy's built different, man. Um, he is wired in a way that uh, I don't know how to put it, but he's <laughs> he's definitely like if you talk about YouTube with him, he'll talk to you all. Like he's very obsessed. I mean, that's kind of the mentality that's that you have to have in 
Jimmy's world is a level of, of a obsession, right? Uh, you have to really like love YouTube and um, nothing else almost. Uh, for him, he, he's also, he's certainly a gamer as well. Um, so when he's not on YouTube, he's going to play games. Just as for us, or at least for me, uh, if I'm not out, you know, helping on a story, whether it be for a YouTube video or even a, a, a TV show or film, I'm going to watch one of these movies. I'm going to pop in a, something in the background and I'll, I might pay attention to it, depending on the movie. I might pay attention to it. I might not. I might actually like watch the whole thing. Um, it's very, you know, I'm obsessed with filmmaking as a whole, right? Uh, that's not to say, you know, I'm sure uh, I don't want to speak on behalf of Jimmy, but you know, it, everyone that, that, uh, if you've hung out with Jimmy long enough, you're going to talk about YouTube <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> and even when we were in Antarctica, like we were talking about YouTube, you know, um, we had no connection, <laughs> no internet connection at all. And we were talking about like some of the most cool videos that we've seen lately on YouTube. Yeah. Um, well, but, I, I think that like, yeah part of the burnout is if you are having to churn out content like daily or weekly, that's when it really catches up to you. I think if Jimmy has transitioned into sort of doing one video a month or, you know, two videos a month, like on the main channel, I think that, you know, so if you're doing 12 to 20 videos a year, that's probably more sustainable. I think it's when you're, constantly having to put out weekly videos that's when it really you know at least with like tom scott and some of these other creators where that's when they really get burnt out especially if they Correct. don't have the, the team around them to, right. to sort of like take a lot off their plate i think jimmy has been able to sort of delegate some of that stuff to oh, yeah. other people yeah. which, which helps if, if jimmy has a i mean there's like a, over 100 people <laughs> that work out of uh beast headquarters in greenville north carolina yeah when you guys were in team. Uh, Antarctica, in addition to talking about YouTube, did you also remark on the frigidity and the <laughs> weather and the penguins <laughs> and talk about, were, were you able to be present at all or? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we peeped our head outside, 60 mile per hour winds. <laughs> There's only so much you can do in hurricane level How's, how's the Wi-Fi down yeah. in Antarctica? <laughs> there's no Wi-Fi. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing, there's none of that. Um, Not, you don't get a good signal down there, huh? No, <laughs> no. I mean, we had sat phones. So, uh, yeah. you know, 30 minute calls, um, cost like, I think anywhere from 300 bucks, 300 to 500 bucks, depending on a lot, the length of the call. Uh, penguins are out in Gold Bay, uh, at least where we were staying. Uh, we we're at uh, Union Glacier, which is about a, a good two and a half, three hour plane ride from where we were. We were literally in the middle of a glacier closer towards inland um, uh, versus where the penguins, any, okay. So where we were, all that exists is ice, not even water. Uh, and there's no vegetation at all. It's rock and ice. That's really it. And wind. <laughs> there's nothing out there. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a true desert, a true Mm. Antarctic I feel like desert. we could do a sequel to the thing, but we'll, we'll do it I mean, with like that, that, that I, I, trip that you took that with I brought up. Like a YouTube version of the thing. Yeah. I, I brought that up, uh, as a joke, uh, to ALE, uh, who we, we partnered with, by the way, there's three ways of getting down there. You can go down, there's Australia, you can go South Africa, uh, to Camp Murdo, which you need to be a scientist to do that. So we can go there. Um, and then there's a South, uh, Africa way going through mm -hmm. Cape town. Uh, mm -hmm. Camp Witchway is the name of that particular location. And then the route we went to was uh, was Punta Reinas Chile, which is the southernmost town in the world before you get to Antarctica. And that's a five-hour plane ride to uh, this place where we stayed at was Union Glacier. Uh, I'm guessing that was the, the quickest way from North America to, to get down there, right? Especially correct. because you have people yeah. flying from different we areas. Did, we flew from Greenville to Atlanta, Atlanta to Santiago, Chile, from Santiago, Chile to Punta Reinas Chile. And then quarantined... Uh, due to COVID for, uh, about a week. And, uh, the folks that we 
you know, that we partnered up with uh, Antarctic Logistics and Expeditions, ALE. Uh, they do this every year and uh, it's not cheap. It's, it's very expensive. And uh, so you have to really, you know, know what you're doing when you get down there. We planned this out. This is probably the most meticulous video I had to plan, just do the nature of, you know, the literal nature of this video. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, can have no room for error. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's certainly some things um, that I've asked early on, <laughs> you know, uh, kind of joked about the, if you Google this, in tonight's Factor Fiction, we're looking into an image from Google Earth that's getting some buzz. It shows an area of Antarctica that some people claim clearly has pyramids covered in snow. Several websites say the pyramids were likely made by an intelligent human civilization long ago. It's pure fiction. The so-called pyramids in the Google Earth image are just mountains. Their pyramid-like shape is called a horn. And these type of mountains are a common feature of areas with glaciers. There's no evidence the humans ever lived on Antarctica, let alone build pyramids there. You sure about that? You sure about that? You sure about that? I asked them, what's this, uh, <laughs> what's this pyramid in Antarctica? Right. I, and they're like, what pyramid? I'm like, well, let me show you. I, I, I mean, I popped it up on the presentation and I uh, Google earthed it. And uh, yeah, just type in Antarctica pyramid and lo and behold, there's a photo right there on Google Maps, Google Earth of a pyramid not too far away from Union Glacier. It looks like you could trek out there, maybe take maybe a day or so. I have no idea what you're talking about. What are you talking about? I'm like, no, it's right here. It's, it's on Google. You, you're not seeing that? No, that's not there. It's not there. What is it showing up on Google for? And they were dead serious. Like the way they, you know, said, no, that we've, ne we've never seen that. I'm like, can we go maybe check that out? Is there a way for us to maybe, you know, <laughs> trek it near that area to see if there are pyramids? Nope. We can't do that. Why? They didn't give me a reason. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. We, you know, it's just a little too far out. We, you this know, we're going to go these mountains shit. and stuff. And I'm like, huh, this is odd. Very odd. And um, yeah, exactly. That's the guy that was going on in my head. I was like, yeah, it would have been a... To me, I, I could be, it would have been a really cool video. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Mr. Beast finds a pyramid in the middle of Antarctica. To me, that's like, we break the internet. Uh, so I had to ask and entertain that um, just because, just you know, I'd want to see that for my own pleasure. And I don't know, I just, uh, there's there's an explorer in me that uh, wants to venture into to seeing that kind of next level unknown. I kind of grew up with a dad who watched you know, uh, maybe one too many <laughs> UFO <laughs> chronicles on the history channel, you know? <laughs> oh my gosh. So, so like, some of these theories and stuff, I've always tried to, I've always been curious to maybe potentially explore. I mean, maybe, uh, maybe but, the CBS is in on the, the conspiracy, but it, I'm looking at a CBS news article and this is that it's a mountain and it's, it looks like a pyramid due to erosion. Correct. But it's not, but it's not like uniform, like a pyramid. But right. It looks, it looks cool. Yeah, I wanted to at least maybe just take a look at it, you know, if it's a, a day to trek out there, you know, we take a good expedition team out there, we actually might get some cool shots out of it at least, Yeah, you know. Um, and, and that's missed opportunity. And, and that's yeah. where the horror movie starts is that you discover this pyramid <laughs> and all these ancient spirits come out. and Exactly. Or, or, or Transformer, right? Isn't that the plot to one of the Transformers movies? One of the Decepticons wakes up from a pyramid down there. Megatron crash landed before he could retrieve the cube. Kind of ancient virus comes Correct. out. Correct. <laughs> infects Mr. Beast. He actually becomes a beast. <laughs> the be prophecy is fulfilled. Series. Yeah. <laughs> but he he wears like a, a necktie, so you have to address him as Mr. Beast. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Beast. Sir yeah. Beast. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that would be a video. That would break the internet for sure, hands down. But well, you know, if this podcast gets uh you know successful enough, we can mount our own Antarctic expedition. There you go. Yeah. And just uh, record from the tent or from the top of the pyramid. We could do our fir the very first podcast out from Antarctica. Yeah, episode one thousand. 
<laughs> and enough Patreon subscribers that will do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Antarctica was a lot of fun. I would like to go back out there eventually. Um, there'll be a time. There will definitely be a time. I don't know if it will go through uh, that side, but um, I would love to potentially venture out to that pyramid or mountain, whatever. But um, <laughs> there's a lot of questions I did ask early on. So I won't get into, but that was certainly one of them. The pyramids was something, um, you know, I'm kind of spitball in terms of concepts. The beauty of YouTube, the, the in my opinion, is the spontaneity is like, not only come up with some of this stuff on the fly, but even beforehand, if that idea like, oh shit, that's a banger idea. Let's, let's make that happen. Right. Okay. Shoot. Well, well, let's, let's do it. Let's, let's focus in on that and we'll shoot it within a week or two. Well, in this particular video, I mean, with Antarctica, it was a couple of months, but that's the feeling that I would, I would feel whenever, you know, Sean and I, when we were brainstorming with, with some of the videos that we did back at jump cut, uh, you know, we had some brainstorming sessions where just spitballing a million ideas to each other. And then it wasn't until someone had a really crazy idea and then we'd all, you know, like unanimously laugh or generate some kind of emotional response altogether at the same time. We're, we're all like, okay, that's the, that's obviously the idea. Mm. That's what we got to do. Right. And then we shoot it in less than a week. <laughs> Go. I think doing, doing those reps, you know, uh, is we didn't talk about, um, uh, that feature you showed me when you were here, Frank, uh, the hand, um, the horror film, uh, are you talking about, um, um, Baca, they're, they're yeah, Baca, yeah, yeah, yeah. Guys. talk to me, yeah. talk to me, talk to me. Yeah. We already kind of covered it, I guess, in episode one a little bit, but you know, as a, as a, um, uh, success story of kind of jumping from the YouTube world to, to like future landscape, I think it's clear that the, those reps, you know, uh, really paid off and kind of what, what you're sharing about is brainstorming in a room and seeing what resonates with, with the collective, you know, and just gaining that sensitivity and, and being able to, uh, I don't know, put together, uh, videos like in a short time frame instead of working six years on a single thing, like I do, like, going from concept to completion in a, in a month or a few weeks or a few months, you know, max <laughs> mm. is like amazing, amazing training ground. Actually, yeah. let, let's, let's go on that. What, what advice would you give, you know, to your 21 year old self or, or to someone looking to start a career in content creation, whether it be on YouTube or the, the blurred lines that we're talking about here with, with filmmaking and YouTube. Like for me, I would say that don't, allow yourself to be paralyzed by thinking of like the perfect idea. Like I I'll, I'll make this thing when I have like the best idea. Um, I think you really have to learn by doing and making mistakes and you'll learn a lot faster that way. And, you know, part of like this podcast, I think this podcast is going to evolve eventually into a place where we really start to find our voice and find out what works. But I think that you're never going to find that place unless you just jump on and take a chance and see what happens. Totally. Um, it, it's, I, I'm really a big believer in learning from experience. Um, because I, as much as you can plan something out, you might find that in practice, something else works completely better and you'll only know that by doing it. I want to jump off that and say, also don't get paralyzed by what anyone else is doing. You know, or, you know, I think I just, it's very easy, especially on social media to get in compare and despair mode. When you look at the Mr. Beasts of the world and you're like, well, pff, could never dream of being able to compete at that level. So why even try, you know, um, there is sheer abundance on the internet. Like you can carve out uh, your own audience, your own niche, just by being you, just by having the courage to put your stuff out there. Um, it doesn't detract from anyone else. It's additive and it's okay to not, um, 
be the best or to be the most followed or whatever. It's not a competition. Or to make I guess mistakes. I've been, yeah. It's, it's totally fine to make mistakes. Yeah. I've been not messy enough. I wish I was, I, w- I wish I gave myself permission to be messier, put myself out there more um, because I'm such a perfectionist and I'm afraid and I need the validation and I, oh God, what are people going to think? <laughs> so I think that would be my advice to my younger self is, is, uh, is just be you, you know, you gotta, you gotta cut to, uh, there's a, there's a, a snippet from Aladdin where the genie, uh, is, uh, transforms himself to, to a little bee and is talking to Aladdin when he's about to go on his first date with Jasmine remember, and he says, be, be yourself. yourself. <laughs> You got to <laughs> splice that in there. <laughs> I love that. I love that. We will cut to that. That's, that's, that's great. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, okay. Uh, I would love to bring up a, just real quick for the audience. Um, I've already had a couple questions that kind of came, came in through my DMS. Um, if you can, drop a comment or uh, let us know how we're doing. If you have any questions for us that you'd like for us to field uh, for a future segment, we would love to, you know, we'd love to answer your questions. So uh, that's a little mailbag segment. Exactly. That'd be great. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, gentlemen, I think this was a good talk. I can talk about this all day (laughs) with YouTube and, uh, and filmmaking as a whole. I mean, we were talking about this loosely on a text thread this weekend um yeah i think you scratched the surface of yeah. uh your your experience you know on the b side too so yeah i'm sure we will uh have some spiritual part two to this soon enough we will but uh yeah so great to chat all right gentlemen hi guys it was a great chat with you guys until next time see ya thanks for listening mom <laughs>